and I am the Deputy Director of the Program for Injury Prevention Research, uh, Education and Research. Uh, this, the program is a collaborative initiative of the Colorado School of Public Health and the University of Colorado School of Medicine. And we run a monthly research to practice learning series. Uh, and really, I'm, I'm so excited to have these two speakers here today. So it's summer and our kids are all supposed to be playing outside and we're supposed to be getting ready to binge watch Olympics, or at least I was. <laughs> um, but obviously nothing is, is normal this year because of the COVID pandemic. Um, and I think, especially now as we're all wondering kind of how do we return to normal sports, I think it's a perfect time to consider also what that normal should look like. What, what are our best practices for um, still encouraging sports participation and the many benefits from that, but also really trying to prevent injuries, both acute and the kind of chronic trauma that we see. Um, and so those are some of the things we'll be talking about today. Uh, so first, a little bit of housekeeping. Um, please put questions in under the Q&A at the bottom of your screen. We'll pause between speakers to do some questions um, as well as then at the end. And so now it is my great pleasure to introduce our first speaker. Uh, Dr. Christina Yanetsos is a colleague of mine uh, in the emergency department at the University of Colorado Hospital. Uh, but unlike me, she has a very distinguished career as an athlete in judo, including traveling all over the world, representing the United States in world Pan American uh, championships and games, and uh, then the 2004 Olympics as an Olympic alternate, alternate. As I mentioned, she now practices emergency medicine as an assistant professor and physician at the University of Colorado here on campus. Uh, and she's also medical director of our forensic nursing examiner program, uh, which engages with patients who've been involved in domestic violence and other uh, kinds of assaults. And maybe we'll have her back to talk about that a different day. Um, her own research in concussion and the sport of judo helped USA Judo adopt the Heads Up program for coaching and referee awareness. And she traveled, now travels with uh, USA Judo as a team physician and was supposed to be heading to Japan later this month for the Olympic Games. And I will now turn it over to her. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Emmy. Thanks for having me. Um, I'm really excited to be here for our research to practice seminar series. So I, my name is Christina Anetzos. Um, I am here to chat about, um, from the mats to the sidelines, um, a little bit about USA Judo injury prevention. Uh, so Emmy, thanks for the great introduction. Uh, so I am a uh, emergency medicine physician at uh, UC Health and I am um, an assistant uh, professor at University of Colorado Anschutz Medical Campus. I am a team physician for USA Judo and uh, recently named as uh, a, a team physician for Team USA for the Tokyo 2020 Olympics, which we now know have been uh, postponed to 2021. So a number of you may not know what judo is. So judo is actually a combat sport, uh, which is an Olympic sport um, that uses the leverage of your opponent to throw your opponent and off balance them. Um, you can submit or uh, beat your opponent by throwing them directly on their back, um, by submitting them with a choke or an arm bar, um, or even um, pinning them for 20 seconds and holding them down. So, um, our injury profile is pretty wide. Um, it's very, very diverse. So um, we can have concussions, we can have cervical injuries, um, we can have joint injuries, um, and even dissections from uh, chokes. So why judo? And we talked a little bit about this, but I started judo when I was five years old. Um, I was a national team athlete and I actually qualified my division for the Olympics in 2004. Um, an injury, so I dislocated my shoulder at Olympic trials, um, but I vowed to come back and make sure that our athletes um, stayed safe and healthy. Um, so I became a team physician uh, a few years ago. Um, and how do you become team physician? So it takes a lot of passion. Um, you have to have passion for your sport and passion for your athletes. Uh, a lot of times it's a volunteer-based program, so uh, multiple sports and different sports will have pools of, team, of physicians and athletic trainers um, and physical therapists and chiropractors who volunteer to help out with the sport. And you can help with events, you can help uh, traveling with the team. Uh, you know, it's really important um, that you kind of know the rules of judo and have an understanding of the sport to kind of to volunteer for the sport. And the other thing is, is making sure that you know, um, so we have USADA, which is the US Anti-Doping Agency and the World Anti-Doping Agency. And so you have a little bit of understanding that 
some common medications um, that might be in cold medications or even patients with asthmatics, um, some of these, uh, these products are actually banned in sport. And so you kind of have, have to have an understanding so you can counsel your athletes on things that they can take and not take. So uh, we'll focus down on concussion, but um, so concussion in the sport of judo can be either from a direct or indirect uh, impact um, to the head, neck, or body. Um, you can have impact with the ground, you can impact with another athlete, or you can even have impact with um, surrounding equipment to the mats. The epidemiology of uh, judo, uh, concussions in judo, really there's very few studies that actually focus on judo. The incidence is largely on loan, but it's estimated that head injury is about 6.6% and concussions are 4.1% of all judo-related injuries in American youth. Um, there was a study in 2008 to 2015 uh, that basically evaluated what judo athletes went to the emergency department for. 19% of those visits were related to head injuries and 37% of those were actually diagnosed as concussions. So it's fairly prevalent in the sport of judo. Why did this become important to me? So um, between the years of 1983 and 2010, there was actually 100, over 100 children who um, died in Japan, um, largely from uh, brain injury. And so there is a particular um, culture um, that is very, very discipline oriented and sometimes often hazing um, at the time where athletes um, would be thrown repetitively um, and again, there was a number of athletes who either had some sort of intracranial hemorrhage or second impact syndrome from concussions. And so this became really important to me to help increase awareness. I will mention that in the United States, there has no, not been any uh, deaths related to concussions in the sport of judo um, that we know of. And then uh, in France, which actually has one of the largest uh, participant base in the sport of judo, um, there has been no such uh, injuries as well. So there are some concussion challenges in athletes, um, as we may be aware of. So they're largely underreported by athletes. 36% um, didn't know that they sustained concussions. 66% um, didn't know that they were serious enough to report. 41% didn't want to leave the game. And this is really important because um, there's often times that I am taking care of athletes um, at a national or international level that, um, you know, they sustain a concussion and um, they're in a qualifying event for the Olympics. And so it's, it's really a difficult conversation to have with them. Um, so oftentimes my methodology is kind of to do my bedside, my mat side evaluation. Um, I'll have a conversation with them and kind of talk about risks and benefits and have them go sit down and, um, you know, say, Hey, you're up in seven more matches. Um, why don't you go take a break and come talk to me in 20 minutes or so and tell me how you feel. And usually that shared decision-making comes down to, hey, I think this is too risky. Um, I'm gonna sit out, I wanna be better for my next event, um, which is usually our goal to make sure that they stay healthy. Um, so frequency, uh, concussion, desire for athletes to return to the sport are usually factors that amplify the risk of those um, negative consequences, um, especially in martial arts. And then uh, the underreporting of concussions oftentimes um, leaves us with, you know, who identifies these concussions and we, are often left with um, coaches, and those coaches can be key to recognizing traumatic brain injuries. So we did a survey. Um, this kind of led to um, me creating the survey. Um, so it was a survey of U.S. judo coaches, um, and it was their evaluation of mild traumatic brain injury in the sport of judo. Um, and we set up the survey. It was an anonymous survey, online survey. So it was sent out to over a thousand coaches across the U.S. of different levels who were registered with USA Judo. Uh, we had a fairly decent response rate, uh, so about 20-25% uh, um, responded, and we evaluated things like uh, knowledge and uh, behaviors and attitudes uh, towards concussion as well as practice patterns. And so we had some really interesting results. So. Um, in regards to uh, knowledge, um, what's interesting is that all 50 states at this point have uh, information or some sort of uh, concussion legislature related to um, identification um, and awareness as well as return to play um, guidelines. And 72% uh, of coaches didn't know that these, uh, le this legislature actually did actually exist. There are laws in place um, through the states. 
Um, the other thing is, so most coaches could actually um, recognize and identify concussion symptoms, but uh, alternatively, they also identified things such as abdominal pain and sweating as concussion symptoms. And so 40% of coaches identified these um, non-concussive symptoms as concussions. Um, when it comes to uh, red flag symptoms, so there was kind of a wide variety. So things like um, unilateral uh, vision loss or neurologic changes um, are red flag symptoms, um, somewhere between 30 and 80%, depending on the symptom. Symptom, did coaches actually identify those as concussion symptoms and not red flag, you need to go get help now symptoms. Um, so our attitudes and um, uh, with our coaches, most of them felt that they, um, they could do something to help our, their athletes um, to prevent concussions. Uh, most felt empowered to do things um, like um, make sure that mat areas were appropriate and that they had necessary resources. Um, they uh, also felt comfortable referring uh, athletes to be evaluated by uh, medical personnel. And usually that, that was correlated with more students and uh, more experience uh, in years uh, at, from the coach. And then lastly, with practice patterns, um, less than 20% of dojos or judo um, gyms had some sort of medical personnel at practice, contrast to 85% uh, that had uh, medical personnel at competitions. So large variation, which really brings it back to um, coaches, um, and people who are watching practice can really help out to identify these concussions for uh, con con concussions in athletes and make sure they are getting referred in the follow-up that they need. Um, most of them actually did not have a, so actually one third of them did not have any sort of return to play or, hey, you can come back on the mat once you have been cleared by a medical personnel requirement, um, which, which, which was also very interesting. So how do we um, do injury prevention uh, in the sport of judo? So it, it starts with the ground up. So making sure that we can identify knowledge gaps and making sure that we um, make sure that the, the coaches feel empowered to help prevent concussions um, in their local dojos. Um, oftentimes there was improvement in mats and training me methods that could decrease concussion. There was a study in Japan that actually showed that either a spring floor or some sort of under uh, mat property can help decrease the force um, and, and impact that an athlete will take when they um, hit the ground when they're being thrown. Um, things like crash pads when you're doing repetitive throwing can also help. Um, having a, creating an optimal number of athletes per square foot to prevent athletes from uh, bumping into each other as they're randoring or um, fighting. And then uh, making sure that walls and um, objects in the area are padded. The other thing that's really interesting about the sport of judo is that we learn to fall very, very early on. And so your first practice, you're learning to fall. And that means you are taking your chin and tucking it to your chest. And then as you roll backwards, you are slapping the side of the mat to help distribute that force throughout your body. So it becomes a muscle memory to where our athletes um, it's very, it's second nature when we get thrown to tuck our chin and slap the mat. And so that helps also, um, those falling techniques helps to decrease um, concussion as well. And then the other thing is sport concussion training. So in 2018, um, after we did this study, uh, USA Judo um, came on board with Heads Up. And so there's a number of other national governing bodies who have adopted this as well, like USA Volleyball. Um, but basically, so Heads Up provides this free training for um, concussion awareness and education um, to coaches, athletes, um, and parents. And so um, in order to, for a coach to be certified with USA Judo, they will um, take this course every two years. And what's interesting is that we actually also have expanded recently to include uh, referees to take this requirement as well. So it also helps, to, um, helps with awareness for, with concussion in the sport of Judo. So um, now we'll talk a little bit about international sport changes. So, you know, we talk about the local, we talk about state and national, um, but what does it take to make an international sport change? As you can imagine, it takes a lot of work. Um, so we have sport conferences that meet um, on a, you know, annual basis. Uh, and basically it helps to um, identify issues and make changes. Um, so one of the things that we, um, that were being noticed um, was that, so in order for an athlete to score a point, 
or win a match, they're throwing an athlete onto their back. And so um, a number of athletes have found that if they try and bridge out of a throw, they land on their head and they don't hit the mat with their back, obviously. So all of that impact is loaded into one area and you get axial loading on the head. Um, and so this was actually banned in 2018. So um, the athlete who is doing this or being thrown will be disqualified or get Hansukamake um, for doing a, a bridge out of a throw. Likewise, there um, have been other um, techniques which have um, prompted athletes to put their head forward while they're doing the throw in which the um, uh, opponent and the um, thrower will both land on their heads. And so those also were banned in the sport. So how do we in implement change? So we, we, you know, first and foremost, athletes and making sure our athletes are educated and have awareness of concussion, as we know that underreporting is a major issue. Um, we make sure our local dojos have the resources that they need, and that includes um, training and um, mat implementation and making sure that all the equipment is up to par. Um, and then uh, state, we have concussion laws and, you know, state judo organizations that can help implement those things as well. Nationally, we've taken on the Heads Up program to make sure that there is increased awareness and our coaches and referees can help identify these, um, so it can help to identify traumatic brain injury and concussions. And then internationally, we can implement rule changes, which obviously take a, a great deal of effort between um, coaches, referees, athletes, and uh, national governing bodies from across the world. Um, so yeah, so a lot of change and uh, making sure that our athletes stay safe. Any questions? Uh, Christina, thank you so much. I, as an ER doctor, like I'm having like horrible anxiety about those photos you, you show. <laughs> so um, I have a question um, uh, while we wait if, for the audience. If you have questions, please put them in the Q&A. Um, so as we think about leading up to what Dr. Comstock is going to talk about, are there different uh, regulations for men and women in judo or are they gender neutral? So uh, back in the day, so back when I was an athlete, there there was some differences between men and women. So men would do a five minute match and women would do a four minute match. But outside of that, not too much rule changes. Now we've kind of all gone across to a four minute match and there's no discrepancies between men and women. Um, so the rules stay the same. Super. Um, there's a shout out to you from Dr. Babarda in the <laughs> chat box. Um, another question, I alluded to this before. Oh, and, and we just had one come in. So uh, how have athletes and judo organizations across different countries responded to the efforts to change rules? So, I mean, um, it's, 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 it really varies. So different regions have a particular style of judo. Um, for example, um, some of the Eastern Bloc countries, um, it's a lot of power techniques um, and also a lot of, so recently we actually um, said no more leg grabs. So in wrestling, you can do like a double leg um, and throw the person or grab the leg to throw them. And so we recently outlawed those. Uh, I think it was more for a stylistic and um, presentation for towards the media to make judo a little bit more um, palatable to the general population. Um, and so, you know, there has been pushback on certain things like that, but I think when it comes to safety, um, everyone is in agreement that we want to make sure our athletes stay safe and healthy. Um, so not too much pushback on some of these rule changes. Okay. Um, there's another question uh, that uh, sounds like uh, you, I think, mentioned you started judo at age five. Are there age recommendations generally for starting? So uh, most clubs only require that your uh, athlete is potty trained. So you can get on the mat as soon as the age of like two or three if you're potty trained. In fact, my younger brother was watching me do judo, I think at the age of two. And by the age of three was doing some of the most advanced techniques just from watching them over and over again that he had amazing technique at a super young age. So yeah, as long as they're potty trained. All right, get them started. Well, <laughs> that leads into a question from Dr. Comstock, which is, the sort of the issues you talk about at the elite level around concussion um, prevention and so forth, how are those, uh, I was gonna say trickling down, but that's sort of, you just, we're talking about potty training, I'm really sorry. How are those <laughs> built 
filtered down to to the level of adolescents and kids, or is that an area where where there's concern around um, protection for kids? Yeah, so um, I think most of our athletes, when I have a shared decision making uh, discussion with them on the sidelines, uh, they're able to make those decisions, right? Um, but when it comes to youth, you're also interacting with parents, and so. Um, sometimes that makes it a little bit difficult because, you know, to the, to your, to the parent, they like want their athlete to be the next Olympic athlete. Right. And so having that discussion, like, Hey, you know, the referee just came to me and said, your athlete, um, or your, your child has, um, had a loss of consciousness after being thrown and was acting confused when they went to get them up, you know, and, and the recommendation is that they probably should sit out from this you know, there has been a lot of feedback, pushback, but I think ultimately when you um, explain the risks in the future and that you want to make sure these athletes stay healthy long term, a lot of times, um, you know, there's, there's a little bit more awareness. So I think the fact that USA Judo has brought on the CDC Heads Up and has it as a resource on their webpage, it helps not only with coaches and referees, but, you know, parents and athletes have access to that program as well. And so I think a lot of awareness has been brought on by concussions and a lot of the movements that we've been doing in the last several years. Oh, that's great to hear. Um, there's also a question globally, how do the risks in judo compare to risks in other martial arts? So they're very similar. So in fact, um, things like wrestling uh, or jujitsu, we have very, very similar incidents of uh, injury patterns. And so um, oftentimes they're quoted um, one for one and very similarly. So um, takedowns and wrestling have very similar uh, mechanistic techniques, um, which is why a lot of athletes in judo will cross train in wrestling or jujitsu. And so it kind of, it goes across the board. So very, very similar. That's good. I'm always grateful when you're working at the same time that I am working in case anybody gets out of control, I could just call you over. But, um, <laughs> Uh, so maybe one last question, if I may, before we turn it over to Dr. Comstock, and then we can do uh, more discussion at the end. Um, on the, in the realm of COVID, um, you showed some pictures of judo participants. You're pretty close to each other. So yeah. my gosh, how, um, I know you've been involved in some of the discussions about return to to competition and can you comment on that? I think people Yeah, do so I actually, um, I was, I didn't wanna get too much into it, but as we know, <laughs> COVID, COVID, even though we were like trying to avoid, avoid COVID and politics, I mean, it still circles in, right? Um, so it was very, very interesting when this all first started. Um, so I would say there was like an inch, initial impact and then there was a during COVID impact and now there's a post impact. So initially we had athletes all over the world um, trying to qualify for the Olympics, right? And so as certain countries were shutting down and shutting down travel, not every athlete's right to play was being honored. Uh, obviously they can't participate if they can't travel in events. Um, we had athletes traveling to Russia um, and the events got canceled in flight um, for a qualification event. So that was really, really stressful. So when um, overall there was a travel ban, it actually made things a little bit easier. And you know, when the Olympics were postponed, I think a lot of anxiety about qualifying um, was, was alleviated by making sure that our athletes are staying safe and not having to risk themselves traveling and being exposed. You know, meanwhile, while things are shut down, you know, some of the higher level athletes are continuing to train at home and uh, do individual workouts. Um, we had implemented through USA Judo some virtual workouts. So we actually host virtual workouts on our webpage um, through different clubs across the country. So our athletes will stay healthy and continue to train. Um, but the return to play is actually really, really interesting. Um, so I've participated in a number of uh, USOPC calls as well as um, helped with USA Judo. But the main thing is, is every sport is a little bit different. So track and field, very different from Judo, which is a contact combat sport. Um, you know, there will never be a 0% transmission risk in the sport of Judo for anything. Um, whether it be viruses or um, things that you can pick up from the mat or anything. So it has never been a zero transmission sport. So there is a little bit of risk that you take on when you do a contact sport in general, but I think this has definitely brought things into play. So USOPC has brought on um, a five phase return to play. Um, and each sport has kind of adopted their own changes. So the initial is with our you know, lockdown, um, how we should be training at home. 
as things continue to open up, there's still a, a focus on training at home and training outside. And then um, a phase three is where gyms start to open up, but there's obviously restrictions. And so um, limiting the number of people within gyms, um, making sure that you have um, the correct uh, disinfecting equipment, making sure that all the equipment is infected, you're still social distancing during this event, which obviously is difficult with judo, right? Um, so you're doing individual training. Um, and then, you know, we, we are implementing things like screening forms and temperature checks for the dojo and making sure that people are doing things to make sure that there's a diminished risk of um, transmission of COVID. And of course, there's a phase four where gyms open up, but we still are being cognizant because COVID is still around. And so, you know, still the, the same things, whereas we are, you know, filling out those screening forms and temperature checks and we're disinfecting the dojos and we're limiting spectators and we're continuing to make sure that no one's sick is coming into contact and at least taking records so that we can do some contact tracing if anyone does become sick. Um, USOPC talks about a phase five, which includes a vaccine and or a treatment, which I think we are still a ways off. Um, so I think at this point, most dojos are either gonna be in a phase two or a phase three um, for, for their return to play. And so it's, it's definitely very interesting um, in considering these return to play precautions. Thank you. I know it's not injury specific maybe, but is, is certainly all very relevant and it's uh, great to, to get insights from people on the front lines. Um, so now we will shift gears a little bit to uh, continuing conversations around sports safety um, to Dr. Comstock, who uh, is a professor of epidemiology at the Colorado School of Public Health, um, also really nationally recognized leader um, in her case in sports injury research, uh, including having been invited, I should say, under the prior administration to the White House to speak at a Healthy Kids and Safe Sports Concussion Summit in 2014. Um, for the past 15 years, Dr. Comstock has directed the National High School uh, Sports Related Injury Surveillance System. If you have any interest in high school sports, you should get in contact with her. Uh, her data set includes detailed reports on over 100,000 injuries sustained during nearly 55 million athletic exposures. Um, and uh, personally, as someone who really appreciates translational work, I am uh, grateful in, in how Dr. Comstock has used those data to really inform policymakers, clinicians, researchers, coaches, and parents on how we can work to keep young athletes safe and healthy, but still encourage them uh, to participate in sports. And today, she's going to be talking specifically about lacrosse, uh, one area that she works on, uh, with a focus on protective equipment, gender, and uh, differences in protective equipment and the resultant concussion risk to girl athletes in particular. Uh, and I will now turn it over to you, Dr. Comstock. You are muted. Hmm. There we go. How's that? I unmuted you. Okay, great. There you go. There <laughs> All right. Sorry about that. Uh, well, thank you, everyone, for. Uh... Oh, and now. There we go. All right. Welcome to my sunroom. Thank you for joining us today. Um, thanks, Emmy, for that introduction. Yeah, I, I really wanted to take this um, research to practice concept that uh, you folks, that Piper is doing to heart and talk about how uh, sports injury epidemiology research can really be helpful in driving policymakers' decision making. So I uh, thought a great place would be to talk about lacrosse, high school lacrosse. Um, and I'm talking about gendered rules, so a, a logical question for anybody to ask is, is high school lacrosse actually a gender comparable sport, similar to the question Emmy asked Christina? And, and the answer is not really. Uh, there are a lot of sports, basketball, soccer, track and field, where everything is completely gender comparable. There are other sports, though, like baseball and softball, where a lot of the um, activities that result in injury, things like running bases, catching and throwing a ball, those are the same, but there's also some unique differences that also affect injury rates and patterns. So in, so in baseball and softball, the pitching motion is obviously very different, and the size of the ball, the difference in equipment is, is also significant. In lacrosse, both boys and girls, both males and females across levels, have similar risks of, for example, lower extremity injuries from rapid acceleration, deceleration, changes of directions, things like that. 
and they both use a, a hard stick, usually called the lacrosse cross or stick, to throw and catch a hard ball that moves at incredibly fast uh, speeds around the field. But these two sports, girls and boys lacrosse, are really different in terms of the rules of play and the protective equipment worn. So what are these differences? Well, boys are allowed to do full body checking and full unlimited, almost unlimited stick checking. As a result of being a, a true combat, full contact sport, they're required to wear hard shell helmets with a full face mask, mouth guards, shoulder and arm pads, heavily padded gloves. Girls, on the other hand, are not allowed to do any body checking at all. And they're allowed to do stick checking, but their stick checking is limited. In fact, they specifically have a thing called the sphere. Oh, and I spelled sphere incorrectly there. Huh? They have a thing called the sphere rule, which prohibits stick checking within this imaginary seven inch sphere in all directions around the head. So they can stick check, but they're not supposed to be whacking each other in the head with the sticks. Well, because the lack of body checking and the spear rule are supposed to protect them from head injury, they, they are required to wear mouth guards and protective eyewear because of the danger of being hit by the ball, but they're actually prohibited from wearing that hard shell helmet with the full face mask that the males are required to wear. Now in 2015, ASTM did uh, come out with a performance standard for a new women's lacrosse headgear. Note it's usually called a headgear, not a helmet. And it's flexible. It's not a hard shell. And that headgear was available for purchase for athletes on, in 2016. All right, so what do these sports look like? Well, here's a couple of photos of high school boys lacrosse. And you see uh, there on the, the red and white teams in that picture, an example of body checking. Um, in the other picture with the blue and white teams, you see an example of stick checking, but you can see how they're outgeared. They, they look like a full contact sport, right? The helmet is obviously a hard shell helmet. You see the face mask and face shield come down all the way below the athlete's jawline, clearly covers the entire face. You can see the heavily padded gloves that they're wearing, the arm protection. You can see the outlines of the shoulder pads underneath the jerseys. Well, what does girls lacrosse look like? Well, you can see one example of how right now you can have some athletes wearing the allowable headgear while other athletes are not wearing the headgear. And you can see in the picture with the green and white uh, combatants <laughs> that that sphere rule doesn't always translate into action on the field. Obviously that uh, athlete with the red headband has her uh, lacrosse stick within the seven inch sphere of the athlete in the white jersey. So let's look a little closer at the helmets themselves. This is an example of just showing uh, the coverage. You can see the boy's helmet is the one with the full face cage. You can see it provides much greater coverage of the athlete's head compared to the girl's helmet or girl's headgear, which leaves the entire jawline open. It leaves the area around the ear open. And let's look even closer at the properties. What I did in these pictures is I literally just took a lacrosse stick. I put uh, 10 pounds of weight into the, uh, into the net of the lacrosse and I just leaned it uh, against the boys and the girls helmet on a head form. And the pure white helmet is the boys helmet. It's a hard shell helmet. You can see that the stick just, you know, nestles up against but doesn't cause any deformation in that helmet. The gray and white helmet is the girl's helmet, and you can see how the stick, just with 10 pounds in the net of the stick, causes a deformation of the helmet. Obviously, when players are out there whack, wing, winging the ball around and whacking each other with sticks, they're using more than 10 pounds of force. All right, so why are we talking about lacrosse at all? Because lacrosse is a rapidly growing sport here in the United States, at the high school level particularly. Concussion rates are high in high school lacrosse compared to most other high school sports. And even given those differences in rules for girls versus boys lacrosse, which should protect girls from head face injuries, 
what we see from data is that concussion rates are actually slightly higher in boys lacrosse compared to girls lacrosse and concussions represent a slightly higher percentage of all injuries among girls. And this is an example from the last year of, of full data from High School Rio, a large national high school sports injury surveillance system. When we just look at uh, the top 14 sports in terms of concussion rates, you can see, of course, football by far is, is the lead in uh, rates of concussion. But you can see how boys and girls lacrosse measure up to other sports, other high school sports. And for girls, the only sport with a higher concussion rate than girls lacrosse is girls soccer. For boys, the sports with higher concussion rates are the other full contact sports, football, ice hockey, and wrestling. You'll also notice the difference though between the rates in competition and the rates in practice. Like you see that girls lacrosse actually moved up to the fourth highest practice related concussion rate while boys lacrosse went down to the 12th. So there's something different going on in competition compared to practice in how girls and boys are playing lacrosse. All right, so that brings me to what I really wanted to talk about today, the question of the day. Are high school girls lacrosse players at an increased risk of concussion because they are not allowed to wear the same helmet that boys lacrosse players are required to wear? We recently published a manuscript, uh, just, just a, this, this past month really, in injury epidemiology, some colleagues and I, where that was literally the title of the manuscript. We wanted to just see if we could answer this question. So what was the methodology? We used a retrospective cohort study looking at high school Rio lacrosse concussion data for an 11 year study period from 2008-2009 academic year through the 2018-19 academic year. We compared rates and patterns of concussion in girls lacrosse to boys lacrosse. Uh, for example, we compared the mechanisms of injury and then we calculated an attributable risk and an attributable risk percent to try to get at this issue of, is there an increased risk for girls because they're not allowed to wear the helmet that's required for boys? So what were the results? Um, you can see that we had about 614, we had 614 concussions in the boys, 384 concussions in the girls, you know, in 2 million athletic exposures. So this is a large data set. You see that the rate of concussions overall competition and practice combined, the overall rate was higher in boys than girls. When we start looking at mechanisms is when we really see differences though. Among boys, over 66% of all of their concussions were sustained during athlete-athlete contact. And only 24% were, were sustained as a result of stick or ball contact. So that's literally when an athlete was struck in the head by a, an opponent's lacrosse stick or by the ball. And that's completely flipped for girls. In girls, not only 20% of the concussions were from athlete-athlete contact, and 73% of the concussions were from being struck by a stick or a ball. And again, I said that there was, you know, a little bit of differences between practice and competition. What you can see is there is a slight more athlete-athlete contact injuries in competition for girls compared to practice and slightly more stick and ball contact concussions for boys in practice compared to competition. This is a figure from the manuscript that we just published. So then we actually wanted to break things down in terms of number, proportion, percentage, and rate of concussion by mechanism of concussion. No helmet is 100% protective against a concussion. And helmets actually are not great at preventing that kind of brain rattle injury where an athlete gets struck in the body and their head snaps back and forth and the brain is moving and rotating inside of the skull. So we wanted to only limit this question to types of injuries that we thought helmets might be particularly good at preventing. And it turns out there's a, a pretty good body of literature that shows that these, the hard shell helmet with the full face mask worn by male lacrosse players are actually quite good at attenuating the type of forces that occur when an athlete is struck in the head by a ball or by a stick. 
So you can see here, if we just look at contact with a sticker ball, so only those concussions that occurred due to contact from a sticker ball, again, that represented 72.7% of all injuries among girls lacrosse players and only 23.5% of all injuries among boys lacrosse players. And you can see the rate ratio, the difference. I've circled over there on the edge. So you know, girls more than twice as likely to sustain a concussion from contact with the stick or the ball compared to boys. But obviously, athlete-athlete can contact and other mechanisms can also cause uh, can also cause concussion. So that's why we use the attributable risk calculation. It's used pretty frequently in other areas of research in medicine, at least not infrequently but it really is not used very frequently in sports injury epidemiology, which I thought was interesting. So we calculated the attributable risk for sustaining a concussion resulting from contact with the stick or the ball in girls lacrosse versus boys. So we'll, literally what we're saying here is that we think that girls lacrosse are the group that is being exposed to the risk factor. And in this case, the risk factor is not being allowed to wear the hard shell helmet with the full face mask. So you see, we saw uh, the attributable risk was about 1.75 concussions per 10,000 AEs. That's a little hard for people to get wrap their mind around. So let's think about percentage. The attributable risk percent shows us that 61.5% of the concussion sustained in girls lacrosse as a result of being contact with the stick or the ball could have been prevented if girls had been wearing the same hard shell helmet as boys. That's pretty impressive, 61%. Well, if you remember a second ago, I told you about 73% of all concussions in girls lacrosse are from being struck by the stick or the ball. So if you apply that 61.5% to that 73%, you see that we estimate over 44, 44.7%, nearly 45% of all of the concussions that were sustained by girls lacrosse players during that 11 year period could have been prevented if they had been wearing the helmet that's mandated in boys lacrosse, but is prohibited in girls lacrosse. So what are some of our conclusions? Well, one conclusion is that concussions are obviously a problem for both boys and girls lacrosse players. It's an injury concern in both sports. Because the governing bodies of lacrosse have mandated helmet use for male lacrosse players, they've acknowledged that there is a risk of head face injury that's unacceptable because it motivated them to take an injury prevention effort. And because that helmet is still mandated in boys lacrosse and men's lacrosse, in male lacrosse at all levels, that's evidence that the sporting body, sports governing bodies believe that hard shell helmet is working, it's effective, and they don't believe it poses any unacceptable risk. Because if it wasn't effective, they would have required something better. And if it posed some unacceptable risk, they wouldn't be mandating its use. So if we know there's a concussion problem, if we think the problem's severe enough that it requires an, a preventive intervention, if we believe we have a piece of protective equipment that is effective in preventing that injury, and we don't believe use of that protective equipment is causing any unacceptable ancillary risks, then why aren't the female lacrosse players also required to wear this effective piece of protective equipment? It's an interesting question. And I knew that it was one that we were going to get from the reviewers of our manuscript. So we wrote a regular scientific research paper with you know, data and data analysis, and then we ended up spending a great deal of space in the conclusion section, in the discussion section, doing a, a very extensive literature search to try to think about all of the arguments that people have used against wearing, against having female lacrosse players wear helmets and trying to see if there was any evidence to either support or refute all of those arguments. So here's just a few. Um, 
sometimes you hear people say, well, you know, the girls game isn't full contact, so they don't get hurt as much. So there's just, there's no need. We, they don't need to wear helmets because it's not full contact sport. Well, I just showed you some, some data from High School Rio, and there's lots of other research studies out there that show that, yeah, head face injuries are, are an issue of concern in girls lacrosse. So the no need argument doesn't hold water. Well, then another thing that always comes out is the unintended consequences. If you put girls in helmets, somehow that will cause them to have more injuries. Uh, one argument I've heard, for example, is that uh, the helmet will increase the mass of the head. And so then if there's athlete athlete contact, there will actually be faster um, back and forth motion of the head because of the increased mass and that could increase concussions. Well, that's very unlikely because we didn't see that happen in men's concussion and we don't see it happen in male concussion and they wear the helmets. Um, but a potential negative consequence without strong supporting data shouldn't be enough to prevent us from implementing a, prevent, a preventive uh, effort like helmet use because that's something we could monitor. And if we monitor it and we see there is some increase in unintended consequences, the helmets could be removed from the game again. Another argument is this idea of this gladiator effect, this concept that if you put a helmet on an athlete, they'll somehow play much more aggressively with reckless abandon. Uh, they'll take more risks and therefore they'll increase injury risk. Well, I can't find any evidence that that's a true thing. I can't find any data to support the gladiator effect. It looks like it might just be a myth, a, a conception. But more importantly, that can't occur unless it's allowed to. If coaches still coach the rules of the game, if officials still enforce the rules of the game, players will have to play by the rules of the game and they can't play more aggressively unless we allow them to. Uh, one more thing about the gladiator effect. Um, if it was true that players really could play harder and take more risks wearing protective equipment, then you would expect to see almost all athletes wearing any protective equipment that was allowed because good lord what athlete doesn't want to play as hard as they can right and we don't see that we don't see high school girls wearing this allowable flexible headgear we don't see rugby players wearing scrum caps so i just don't buy the gladiator myth and then there's just the general issue of culture this fear that any adoption of protective equipment will somehow change the sport irreversibly. And finally, for a long time, there was an argument that there was no standard for a girl's helmet. Well, that argument isn't used anymore since there is the standard for the flexible helmet. Um, but even if there wasn't a standard for a flexible helmet, there is a standard for the boy's helmet. And the helmet doesn't care what gendered head it's sitting on. So our conclusion to this paper was literally that there are no defendable arguments. No defendable arguments appear to exist to justify restricting female lacrosse players' access to this effective piece of protective equipment. So just a couple of final thoughts, and then I'd be more than happy to answer questions, and, and I'm sure Christina will as well. Um, one thing in thinking about moving from research to practice is that research can often be slow. It takes a while, particularly if you're waiting to try to find grant funding, and then you have to conduct the study, then you have to write the paper, then you have to submit it for review. You know, that, that literally takes years, and athletes are at risk now. And, um, you know, Christina, as a, a sports medicine physician, can definitely attest to the fact that um, they need athletes, their coaches, and often their clinicians will take whatever act in the action they think is needed to keep them in play. They, don't, they aren't going to wait for us researchers. Not everything that works in the lab translates to the field. Uh, this flexible headgear that's now allowed in girls lacrosse looks good in the laboratory. We don't have any research studies yet to show how it actually works in the, on the field of play. Um, if the soft shell helmet actually is effective in reducing concussions, wonderful, great. US lacrosse needs to ma mandate its use for everybody. If the research does not show it's effective, then we need to just quit pretending and we need to mandate the use of the hard shell helmet for both genders. Uh, primary prevention is always gonna be cheaper and better than any advancements in diagnosis and treatment and management. So I'm all for helmet use if it means no concussions to be diagnosed. 
And, you know, we still don't have an objective diagnostic tool for concussions. So much that we know about sports-related concussions might change once such a tool becomes available. Thank you for your time today. I appreciate getting the chance to share this information with you and talk to you. Dr. Comstock, thank you so much, although you made me really angry, so I don't know if that's a good or a bad thing. <laughs> um, but, but thank you um, really to both of you for also, you know, being real examples of how we take science and get it out there to the field to, to, to win, as you said, sort of people need it. Um, need it now. I was wondering maybe we could just make them pink and then it would be okay. But I won't really ask that question. Um, there are, um, just before we finish too, I just wanted to um, remind people we do have another webinar coming up in two weeks on a very different topic. Um, we have the medical examiner from Washington DC who's going to be talking about the role of the medical examiner um, investigating deaths that occur in custody. So very different topic, but please hope you will join us for that. Um, Couple questions that I'll throw out to Dr. Comstock first. Um, so one, um, how concussions in say rugby versus football might be different if you're thinking about sort of that gladiator effect. Um, and then um, question, would an adoption of protective equipment in girls lacrosse make certain gendered rules like the seven foot rule or shooting space unnecessary? Um, and are there any arguments out there for just letting girls play the same way as boys? So, so removing some of the gender differences. Yeah, um, so let's go back first to the football versus rugby. That's a really interesting question. Um, I actually played rugby for 13 years, so I have a little bit of knowledge about this. Um, I think the biggest difference in the concussion risks in football versus rugby are the tackle. The tackle is really different in football versus rugby. Um, you know, in rugby, they have to wrap completely from the fingertip to the armpit. Uh, there isn't any of this hit people and see how far they can fly that you see in American football. And you also don't have blocking in rugby like you do American football. Um, alternatively, you have a scrum. <laughs> so uh, there's just, a, the game is played differently enough that I think the risks are different. And that really brings us to the fact that every sport is unique and we need to have sport specific injury prevention efforts because those are gonna be the most effective. Um, for the girls and the boys, yeah, absolutely. If you put girls lacrosse players in a helmet, you could get rid of some of the rules like the spear rule would no longer apply. If you wanted to allow girls to stick check throughout the whole body, they could. Um, theoretically, it would no longer be a danger because they would be helmeted and it would be much easier for the officials to officiate because they wouldn't have to worry about was the stick check here versus here versus here. Um, many other aspects of the game though, the girls and the boys game have really different rules and um, one of, the, my, one of my efforts as an injury epidemiologist is to make sports safer while respecting the culture of the sport. And I think that there are some rule differences between girls in lacrosse and boys lacrosse that are so embedded in the culture that it's not appropriate to change them. And I don't think implementing a helmet would do so. Well, thanks, that's a, a, a really important thought, I think, about how we can make things safer without um, yeah, erasing history, perhaps, or, or those cultural differences. Um, I, I think there are a couple of questions that are coming up around advocacy and the next steps, and I think how you, the, this translational piece, um, so both for getting your findings out to, say, parents, coaches, and so forth, in terms of the advocacy they can be doing, or for uptake of helmet use, um, but also for us as professionals, how, I'm curious your thoughts on what we should be doing what you think the most effective ways have been maybe in your own work? Is it through the media? Is it through government task force kinds of work? Is it really community local based? Your thoughts on that would be really helpful. Yeah, so I'll, I'll start with lacrosse and then I'll let uh, Christina go with judo. With lacrosse, uh, with youth sports in general, I think you have to make it go from both directions. You have to work with the policy makers. U.S. lacrosse sets the rules of play for lacrosse. So you have to start with them while also starting with the parents because the parents will pressure those policymakers. And you do that by working with them. A lot of my work has been shared with policymakers. It's never seen the light of day in a media coverage or a peer review publication. It hasn't helped me with tenure or promotion, but it hopefully has helped decision makers make better decisions. That, that's my approach. How about you, Christina? Yeah, so I mean, I, I think, you know, with each sport, there's some sort of um, overlaying regulations and governing bodies. So with USA Judo, we have USA Judo, we have the International Judo Federation. And so 
um, definitely advocating at those levels and even at the local level if there is some sort of um, overseeing regulatory um, and I'm not sure what it is in lacrosse but uh, I, I definitely think that advocating as a parent um, for your kid and making sure that they are um, they have all the resources that they need um, is definitely helpful um, at the you know legislative level for sure I mean you know, we have this concussion, uh, the, the concussion state laws, um, and, you know, things to make sure that everyone has equal access to protective equipment is definitely one of them. Yeah, that's a great point in thinking about access to, to things like equipment that costs money. Um, there's a, Dr. Comstock, there's a question around soccer, girls soccer, and sort of reports of concussion rates being high. I know you've done work in this area. Can you maybe comment on how concussion rates in girls lacrosse versus girls soccer, um, how similar or different they are. And then, so what do we do in sports where people don't wear helmets also, like things like soccer, where I don't think we're moving to that. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I, I showed one slide where it showed uh, the rates by sport and um, yeah, girls, according to High School Rio data, the concussion rate in girls soccer is actually higher than the concussion rate in girls lacrosse. Um, and that brings us to half a question, are they really suffering fewer concussions or are they less likely to report them because it hasn't been a point of emphasis in their sport? Um, there's been a huge point of emphasis in soccer for the last eight years about concussions and head injury and U.S. soccer banning heading in younger players and things like that. Um, so yeah, it is, it is interesting. I, I'm, I'm not sure that the concussion rate is truly higher in girls soccer than it is girls lacrosse. I wondered if it's a recognition and reporting issue. Hmm. But the data can't tell us that. The data can only show that the numbers right now are higher in girls soccer. Sure, as an epidemiologist, I'm sure you would agree that testing, reporting, all of those things are actually important. So, um, and then last question for the two of you. Um, do you see, this gets a little bit to what we were talking about before about kids and elite levels versus sort of the lowest levels. So there's a question, difference in injuries and concussions in the travel leagues that often have fewer rules um, versus, I guess, school-based or other sort of local leagues. Um, and what can we do to have concussion policies and, policies and laws followed in travel leagues as well? I'll let Christine start since she works at the higher level athletes compared to me. So, um, so for, for judo, the, our rules are pretty similar across the board. The only differences are um, at what age you can start chokes and arm bars. Um, so across the board, we have very, very similar rules. And so whether an athlete is traveling nationally or interna internationally, the rules are the same. Um, you know, we have, uh, obviously, we're all governed by the state guidelines, which say that there needs to be some sort of education and then return to play guidelines with medical clearance. And that's across the board in all 50 states. Um, internationally, obviously, um, is much different because, um, you know, you have to have uh, individual countries versus um, the overall governing body. Um, and I think overall, um, everyone is on board with concussion um, identification and uh, make sure that our athletes have medical clearance before return to play. Yeah, and at the high school level, that's a great point, Emmy, that um, clinicians and epidemiologists need to work really closely with policymakers. The state level concussion legislation is a great example. We have a state law in every single state about concussion, but the language varies. In some states, it's high school athletes, and so that is interpreted as only high school sponsored sports. Whereas other states, it's high school aged athletes, and other sports, it's youth athletes, so it's a broader age range. So, you know, that's an opportunity for us to help them craft the language so that it's all inclusive to everybody at risk. Well, wonderful. I thank you both for taking time out today. I I learned a lot. I think it was fascinating. For um, our, our uh, attendees, thank you for coming. Um, please feel free to reach out to these two phenomenal uh, women, researchers, leaders, and so forth. Um, and stay tuned for our next uh, seminar coming up in about two weeks. Uh, thanks all. Play safe and be safe out there. Nice to finally meet you, Christina.